been having conversations with Aboriginal colleagues and it's an honour to sit down with you today and learn more about you. I'm going to ask the first question. Tell me about yourself. Um, my name is Jason O'Neill. Um, I'm a young Wiradjuri man. I grew up in Parks in Central West New South Wales on Wiradjuri country. Um, and Parks is a, um, a small town, but it's a town that I, I love and try to go back to as much as I can, especially to visit my nan who lives in Peak Hill. Um, but it holds a special place in my heart, especially because I, as a young student, was able to really engage with Wiradjuri language as it was being revitalised um, in the park schools. And I kind of carry that with me now, now living off country on Bidjigal land and working as a, a lecturer um, after spending 10 years at UNSW, um, first becoming a lawyer and then getting sucked into the world of academia just because I was passionate about, you know, Indigenous knowledges and um, Indigenous studies and the way we try to speak back to academia and the law and um, create a space where Indigenous knowledge is valued and Indigenous voices can be heard. Um, and now in my role as a lecturer and director of Indigenous legal education in the UNSW Faculty of Law and Justice, I run the Indigenous pre-law program, which is our main pathway for um, Aboriginal lawyers and Torres Strait Islander lawyers into the legal profession. Um, and the faculty over 20 years has brought 150 um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lawyers into the profession, which is fantastic. And now we're starting to see the impact of those people on the profession and the law. Um, incredible graduates like Terry Jenke, who um, kind of leads some of the work that we're going to talk to about today in, around Indigenous cultural intellectual property. Um, and it's just, I feel very lucky and privileged as a young Rajri man to be in this space and to work with our up and coming um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander law students and do that work. Thank you. It's such an exciting space for you to tell us about. We are developing a resource for students mm. that attend arts, design and architecture. And those students will interface with ISEP. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about what ISEP means and how it may impact artists, architects, designers and those in the creative professions? Mm, absolutely. Um, Indigenous Cultural and Intellectual Property, or ICIP, ICIP, refers to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's cultural heritage. Um, it's a, a broad term that encapsulates the knowledge, the, the creations, the artwork, the stories that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people pass down over generations. Um, it refers to knowledges and artworks that belong to the community. They're, they're community owned, they're um, a product of people's connection to country and they're grounded in where mob come from and, and the stories they've been passed on from their grandparents and parents. And so ICIP tries to encapture that kind of knowledge and that kind of um, um, tangible artwork and, and language as well that doesn't fit within the more rigid structures of um, arts and craft or intellectual property or, or trademark law that we have in, in the Western systems. And what are the ways that our students can find out more mm. about the impact of these creative and community led protocols and principles? Mm, absolutely, that's a good question. Um, there are a lot of resources that have been developed by Terry Jenke and her law firm, Terry Jenke and Company, who specialise in Indigenous intellectual property and have been working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists for, for decades now. And they have uh, resources on their website and some reports they've written for government in particular, um, trying to create a better legal framework for organisations to work with Indigenous artists within. Um, and so 
one key document to always go back to is um, the United Nations um, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and that's a key framework that guides a lot of this work. Um, and that, that's where the right for self-determination comes from, which is the foundational right that speaks to Indigenous people's ownership and control over their knowledges, which goes to ICIP. Um, and there's a Productivity Commission report that was just released in 2022, and they looked at the arts industry and the treatment of Indigenous artworks and crafts and the sector as a whole, and they gathered a lot of stories from mob working in the space and artists about the impact of um, unethical and inauthentic art on, on their practice and on their knowledge and culture. And so that's a very recent and very um, valuable resource that students can go to. And as we sit here and think about our cohorts mm. in 2023 and 2024, What's the one piece of advice mm. that you would offer an artist or curator, designer, when thinking about working with Aboriginal artists? Mm. I think the most important thing to keep in mind when you're working with Indigenous artists, whether it's um, adapting or using some of their artwork in your own, whether you're working in textiles and you want to incorporate someone's art in a textile or um, you're in a gallery and you want to display artworks that may have been sourced from you know, an art seller or otherwise, the most important thing to remember and centre is this concept of free, prior and informed consent, um, which really speaks to uh, the artist or the knowledge holder having complete knowledge of what you're intending to do with their artwork, um, having the ability to say no to it being used in that way, and if they choose giving consent in a way that empowers them to still hold and protect the cultural and community knowledge that's embedded in that work. Because the real problem in ICIP is that the standard Western copyright law does not account for the communal nature of Indigenous knowledge. And so when an artist or a gallery or an institution records something and takes something and puts it in written form or they click the record button on a recorder, they actually become the author of that work and the owner of the copyright. And so best practice in this area is often to sign a contract or, or, or a deed with the artist or the person you're working with that in contract law says that they maintain the intellectual property and they license you as the artist or the institution to use that work. And so in that way, you're ensuring that Indigenous cultural and intellectual property is respected in your work. And you can also, there are um, documents being produced by Terry Jenkins and others for use by galleries and institutions that kind of set out the framework of ICIP and you can include that in the contract and say, okay, this is what we're held accountable towards and this is what we, we look to when we use this work. Thank you so much for laying those examples out. I think that they're really helpful mm -hmm. examples. To conclude our conversation today, I'd like to ask you about museums and institutions and if you have any models or best practice mm. that you can share with the students and myself today, that I think that would be fantastic for us to hear about. Mm. I think the fantastic and heartening news in this space is that we've seen a real shift in the attitude of museums, art galleries and universities in the way that they respect and engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists, knowledges and cultural and intellectual property over the last few years. And we've really seen museums lead that charge. Um, a local example could include the Australian Museum here in Sydney and they've really committed to ensuring that their work with Indigenous communities is Indigenous-led. So they've hired Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff, curators, they've um, organised Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, curated exhibitions, and when they're engaging with artists, 
They make sure that they do it through um, Indigenous community organisations and galleries and that those artists have free prior informed consent about how their artwork is used, particularly in the souvenir space. And that's where we've seen a lot of discussion around ICIP and particularly with tourists and not knowing whether or not they're buying an authentic um, art piece, an authentic boomerang, an authentic didgeridoo or painting. And the good thing is that if they go into a gallery to purchase an, an, a souvenir, 99% uh, chance these days that it's going to be an authentic Indigenous sourced artwork that the Indigenous artist has been paid for and has given permission for. And I think that's a really positive shift for arts and media students in this space. And I think there's a lot of exciting work that's going on with the Productivity Commission pushing for um, Indigenous cultural intellectual property specific legislation. So there might be very uh, clear nationwide rules soon that all students, all artists will be able to refer to and engage with, which is great. Thank you so much. That's a really exciting space to think about. Thank you. Very happy to be here.